good evening everyone welcome to a quiz on prosthetic valve so first question for you all what is an optimal prosthetic valve if you can mention three features of an optimal prosthetic valve um, and we can take it from there what in your mind is an optimal prosthetic valve okay so three answers here are less thrombogenic durable and an ideal profile so I think, and this is from really from 1960, where Harkin said it should have lasting physical geometric features, be capable of permanent fixation, chemically inert, so that the patient doesn't react against it, non-thrombogenic, harmless, so not causing any uh, clotting and uh, as well as and should open and close promptly during appropriate phase. So really, the ideal and optimal prosthetic valve should have a low profile should last a long time, should be non-thrombogenic and the body tissue should react against it. So have we got it? You know that is still a question of debate. Now what are the types of prosthetic valves that you know of? So if you are asked, uh, this is a, say an exam question, what are the types of prosthetic valves? Uh, how would you classify prosthetic valves? So mechanical and bioprosthetic, anything else? Apart from, so one is it could be a mechanical valve, uh, the other is it could be a bioprosthesis. So, and you could also in the bioprosthesis divide it further into heterographs, homographs and autographs, right? So the heterographs or xenographs can be either bovine or bovine, homographs would be like an allograft, an autograft is from the patient's own tissue, so either a pericardial or a pulmonary as you do in the loss procedure. The next would be you can have mechanical and you have the three different types which we go into. So essentially you've got biological valves and mechanical valves. So when you talk about biological you need to be able to divide them into hetero, homo and autograft and then your various types of mechanical valves. So this is a heterograft or a zone or a xenograft. Do you know the types that are available on the market of heterografts and what are these? Anyone know the names of these? What bands are these? Anyone name of these valves? Okay, Carpenter's, Edward and Hancock. So the types essentially you can either get stentless or stented, right? So they can either come on, um, uh, have not much of a stent in them, for instance your Medtronic freestyle valve or they can come on a, have a, have a stented feature on them so that you can implant them more easily. They maintain their 3D relationship and the flow is more physiologic. So that is what we use nowadays. So that's right, the one up here is the Carpentier Edward, uh, Hancock, they all look quite similar. This one is Hancock and this one down here is the Carpentier Edward. But if you can see these are heterographs, they are biological, uh, they are stented, they maintain their 3D relationship, the, the flow is physiologic and you don't have so many issues of clotting when you use a heterograft. Okay, all clear on this? So in your exam when you get this question, heterographs talk about porcine and bovine and the other way to classify it is stentless and stented. And some examples are the Hancock and the, the stented is what you can see here. You see here how it's got, it'll have, you, uh, it'll have a, it'll, uh, it's got a stented shape around it, this thing that holds the whole thing. So when you place that in, pushes up against the tissue and maintains that 3D shape, okay, whereas the stentless won't have that, they are just free valves in there. Now what are the advantages and disadvantages of heterograft? Can you name one advantage and one disadvantage of a heterograft? Anyone? One advantage, one disadvantage of a tissue heterograft. Tissue mismatch, 
what do you mean by that? Oh, you mean that in case the in case the body tissue reacts against it. Uh, yeah, they don't always do tissue testing in that sense, right? So less thrombogenic, so you don't really need anticoagulation long term. That's right. So that's a big advantage, especially if females are going to have kids, uh, younger children who you're worried about anticoagulation. What's the disadvantage? What's the big disadvantage of a tissue heterograph? So deterioration and as you see here, although 30 to 35 percent will fail within 10 to 15 years, most mechanical valves will remain functional for 20 to 30 years. So the disadvantage really of the heterograft is that its durability, yes, it has a much shorter life. So it's got uncertain durability because it can perforate, it can regenerate, the cusp can tear. So one is that tearing or perforation. Second is you can have rapid deterioration with fibrin getting deposited, calcium getting deposited. So 10 to 30 percent will need reoperation in 10 years, 30 to 60 percent definitely will need reoperation in 15 years. Which means if you put it let's say in a 15 year old kid, there are about half of them by the time he's 30 he will require a reoperation, big disadvantage. Other is that the small size has to be poor hemodynamics. So there are three disadvantages. Main advantages after the first three months, you don't require anticoagulation. Also, this issue of hemolysis because of the blood cells getting in doesn't occur. So, you don't have a problem of hemolysis and you don't need anticoagulation. Okay, we'll move on to homograft. So, homograft is not porcine or bovine, it's a human tissue, but it's taken from a nether uh, human being. Can you name the types of preservation for homographs? How do you preserve homographs? Name two types of preservation. Okay, that's right. All agree with that. So, cryopreservation and antibiotic. Um, and typically, homographs are harvested within 24 hours of the donor's death. You need to send the team out, get the homographs here in Bangalore. We get it from him hand. Um, and then you can preserve it. Either you can sterilize it with antibiotic. And cryopreservation, if you have a cryolab, is the best. At, uh, I've Red minus 196, our surgeon say minus 286, so you can check that up. Um, but the advantage of a homograft is there's no issue again of anticoagulation, but they also have a certain deterioration over time. Now, homograft, when you place it, you're not going to put any stent in. Uh, you're just directly going to take that homograft and replace whichever valve or aortic root uh, that you want to do. And so the hemodynamics are definitely superior to a uh, heterograph, you can get large size homographs in. One of the issues in pediatrics is that the homographs are very large, so you've got to cut them and make them small because you don't get as many live pediatric homographs. Low thrombogenicity, low rate of infection. Now we'll move on from homograph to mechanical. Now what what is the mechanical prosthesis made of? This, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that you can see that goes into it. But one thing you need to remember is this, that is pyrolytic carbon. Most of the frame is made of pyrolytic carbon. Uh, uh, and then of course different uh, different prosthesis have different elements in them. So which one is this? Can you name this valve? So you would get this in your exams, you can get these as portals, but you just have to name what the valve is and name one advantage and one disadvantage of this valve. So you say star Edward. Someone says St. Jude's. Anything else? So this is neither actually, guys. This is, uh, I mean, this is a caged ball valve. So when they ask you what it is, you can say caged ball because there are different types. There's Star Edwards, there's the uh, Tebeki, which we don't use anymore. So yeah, I think it will be safer for you guys to say ball and cage. And one variety of that would be your Star Edwards. Um, now, what is happening here? Look at the cage. You see this? This cage, oh, I, I, I can't see my pointer. Okay, that's made of alloy. And that puppet that's jumping in and out is made of silicon rubber. So, ball and cage, commonest one that we see here in India that we use is a, it's not used much anymore, but which is the Star Edwards valve. Can you name one advantage and one disadvantage? What is one advantage of the caged ball? 
and what is one disadvantage? Okay, durable is an advantage, fair enough. What is a disadvantage? High thrombogenicity from calcium. That's right. In fact, these are uh, one second. I moved my chat box away somewhere. Hold on one second. So the advantage is that the, it's the oldest, the caged ball band, which has, so you have the most experience. So a lot of the surgeons are very good with this. It's very predictable and it's durable. It can last up to 40 years. Right? We just talked about how the uh, heterographs don't last. 60% of them are gone in 15 years. Disadvantage is high profile. Now, uh, what do you mean by high profile? It takes a lot of space. So, uh, you, it's difficult to use it when you have a small annulus. It's high thrombogenic. In fact, you can get life threatening uh, clotting of this band. So, it's got, because it's got a high profile, it's got poor hemodynamics in small size. That means if you use it, say your annulus is 12 mm and you use a cage ball valve, it takes up so much space that there's hardly any. Uh, blood coming through, so the hemodynamics become very poor. So this is the caged ball. This one, what is this band? I see Davis, she already answered. All agree with that? Right, okay, so this is the tilting disc band. Now again, in this you've got electronic, uh, you've also got the only science band. And if you can see here, they all have the same thing. They have a titanium. It's housed in titanium. And then these discs that you have are uh, carbon coated. So you can remember one, you can remember the Medtronic, that's fine. Tilting this from Medtronic, another option is the only sign. Now again, can you name one advantage and one disadvantage of this tilting disc band? One advantage, one disadvantage. So hemolysis, okay, is a disadvantage. What is an advantage? It has a better profile than diverse. Anything else? So the profile, you're right, it's a low profile. It's much better than the star. As you can see, it's just one disc, right, that's moving back and forth. So even in small sizes, it's actually got very good hemodynamics. It's not totally physiologic because it's just that one leaflet, opening, closing. Um, so your same juice is probably more like your normal leaflet. But the advantage of this is the profile is very low. So it's used, that's why in pediatrics you end up using this because even in small sizes it's got good hemodynamics. And because it's got this kind of one disc, you're, you've got a lot of good laminar flow through it, it lasts a long time. Disadvantage is really thrombosis. You can have sudden catastrophic, and remember it's one leaflet, right? So imagine if you get a clot and that one leaflet gets stuck, then the whole band doesn't work. So anticoagulation is mandatory, it has a very high risk of thrombosis, uh, and so if you have a patient who has a mono leaflet tilting um, disc valve, you need to make sure that your anticoagulation levels, your INR levels are very high. Okay, all clear on that? What is this valve? This is a bi-leaflet stained juice. TTK Chitra. Yeah, you know, we don't have the TTK Chitra here, so our guys won't have seen it. But this is a bi-leaflet valve, right? And the commonest one would be uh, stained juice, which most of the centers use. So you can see the difference here. You've got the two leaflets, unlike the earlier one, which was the single leaflet. So, ominous one, same juice. I think for you all, it's better to start by saying it's a bileaflet valve. Then say one example of bileaflet is same juice. Because as you see here, you also have the carbomedics valve. So, even though same juice is commonly used, there are other companies. In fact, now there's an Indian um, company doing pacemakers, but everyone calls pacemakers Medtronic. But actually, there are many different companies. So, it's a bileaflet prosthetic valve. One example is same juice. Another example is uh, the carbomedics. Now, advantage of this, one advantage, one disadvantage of the same two bileaflet prosthetic valves. Give me an advantage. 
Neha se Amrutha Gad. Do you use the DTK Chitra band there? Because we haven't had it at NH for a while. So you do use it. Okay. So maybe next time you can show us all a picture of that. So the advantage is good hemodynamics. Yes. And what's the disadvantage? Any disadvantages? Disadvantage, of course, is like any other van. So when you ask about any van that you need to take anticoagulation, there is a risk of thrombosis. Uh, they, and, or when you exercise them, you have some gradients typically on these vans. But in general, the bilisted van has mostly advantages as you can see. It's got low profile, so you can use it even in small annuli. It's less thrombogenic than the other van. Got good central laminar flow. If you see this picture here, you see up here, it's got its bilateral like that. So that flow going this way, flow in the middle, and flow that way. So it's got good hemodynamics even when it's small. And if you see, it's got two lateral orifices and one middle minor orifice. So you don't have that chance of sudden catastrophic thrombosis, which you can have with a single leaf. So there you've just got one leaf, but that gets stuck, you're dead. Here, if you get thrombus on one side, you still got two other orifices. So because of this, it is a, a safest valve. The bilateral valve has got less thrombogenic, good hemodynamics, very safe to use, and a low profile, so you can use it in pediatrics. This advantage is similar to all prosthetic valves who have to be on some form of anticoagulation. Okay, so just quickly going over what we discussed. We've got in the mechanical valve three main types, caged ball, formalist is your star edward, single tilting disc, formalist is your metronic, bileaflet, formalist is your stain tube. And you can see the thrombogenicity of caged ball and single tilting are high and bileaflet is much lower. Now if you move on to bioprosthetic and you talk about heterographs like your Hancock, your Carpentier Edwards, they also have from some thrombogenicity, but it's much less. Homographs also much less, and therefore aspirin is enough in those cases. Okay, so let's just move on to selecting an artificial valve. Let's say you have a very small aortic annulus. Which valve would you choose? Which valve would you not choose, and which valve would you choose? Okay, so you could, uh, uh, you think pulmonary rot. What is reagent? What do you mean by reagent? Bileaflet, okay. So we said bileaflet had a low profile. You could do pulmonary rot, and but you would have to also do uh, stentless valve. What do you mean by stentless valve, stain jute? Uh, you mean the stain jute valve, the bileaflet valve, right? So, yes. So the one that you're going to choose is either the tilting disc or your St. Jude. Because so you're going to choose one which you're not going to choose your caged ball. Because tilting disc, as we said, can go has a very low profile and it can be used in small kids. St. Jude can also be. So I think that's also a fair enough answer. What you won't use, you will not use caged ball because it has a very high profile. Now when you have a small aortic angulus, you're right, you can do pulmonary autographs like a drop. You can put in heterographs, you can put in a homograph, and you're basically expanding your aortic angular. So that is one thing to consider. But if you're going to, if you have to use a mechanical mask, then either a tilting disc, single disc, or a bi is what you want to consider. Now, in ABR and MDR, right, when we talk about doing an aortic band replacement or a mitral band replacement, we typically tend to choose a mechanical valve compared to a heterograph. And why is that? Why do we choose a mechanical valve? Of course, I put here that it has better survival, right? So why does it have better survival? Why don't we in that situation use a heterograph? Why don't we take a bovine heterograph? Why don't we? Because it's a high pressure system. So what happens? So it's a high pressure system, right? In the LV has high pressure. so you get a lot of wear and tear of that band, and therefore they get yes, high flow, high pressure, you get early degeneration, and we said that many of these heterographs within 15 years, 60%, 50 to 60% of them will need to be replaced. 
So when you put it especially in aortic and right cell position, they degenerate very fast and most of them within 5 to 6 years need to be changed. And therefore we land up putting mostly mechanical valves. Now of course you can do uh, your own autographs like doing your loss procedure and so on and that has been shown to have uh, a decent survival. Now what about a tricuspid valve? Let's say you had to do a tricuspid valve replacement. What valve would you choose? And why? Okay, so you said bioprosthesis is one answer. Why bioprosthesis? That's right, bioprosthetic is the right answer. Now, why do you choose bioprosthesis? Why would you put a same dude valve in there? So it's low flow, so the degeneration is less. Anything else? It's low pressure, so degeneration is less. Right. So there are two things. One is it's low flow, low pressure, so degeneration is less. Second is because it's low flow, it's got a very high risk of thrombosis, right? So it works both ways. You can put a, so there are two reasons that you choose a prosthetic valve. One is in the tricuspid valve position, it's a low flow state, as you said, low flow, low pressure, so there's a high risk of thrombosis. So if you're going to put some star edward or tilting disc, you're going to have thrombosis. So that's one issue. Second is, normally bioprosthetics deteriorate very fast. Now when you talk about rate of deterioration, aortic deteriorates first, next fastest is mitral, third is tricuspid, right? So it is, because it's a low pressure, low flow, this tricuspid valve bioprosthesis will deteriorate much later. So for these two reasons, remember, because it's, one is because the deterioration will be very late, so you can use a bioprocessor. Second, you actually don't want to use a metallic band because risk of thrombosis on the right side of the heart is much higher. So these are the two reasons you choose a bioprosthetic band when you're going in for the tricuspid band. Okay, good. Now, patient, oops, I didn't come into a question, but who are the patients who you're going to choose mechanical band? And the answer was this, that if you're anyway having to be on anticoagulants, for instance, atrial fibrillation, or you have a history of thromboembolism, or they have a thrombus in the left atrium or in the appendage, and you anyway have to be on anticoagulants, then sometimes you would just go ahead and put in a mechanical valve. Why? Because they're more durable, because you know, okay, this could last a whole lifetime, and I'm not going to have to worry about changing it again. Now, in which patients do you prefer tissue valves? Are there certain indications that tissue valves or bioprosthetic valves are more preferred than mechanic, mechanical valves? And can you name a few of those conditions? Young females, okay, that's good. You would prefer to, for instance, do a ROS. So pregnancy, if they're planning pregnancy. Anybody else? So young females. The right side, okay, as we said, right side of lesions, tricuspid valve, you prefer tissue valve. Age more than 65, why is that? Why age more than 65? Oh, because of anticoid, because of stroke. Why, why do you say age more than 65? What was your indication there? Let's Generation. Okay, so you're saying they're going to not last, live so long, so you can put in a tissue valve. Okay, that's fair enough, and they won't have all the issues of anticoagulation in older age group. So, pregnancy, tricuspid valve, uh, side, right sided lesions are two good things. The other things to consider is in patients who are prone to hemorrhage, because remember, whenever you've got to anticoagulate them, you're going to have to monitor that anticoagulation. So, if you have breathing disorders, very rarely, but if you've got, you know, angiodysplasia, there's something weird where you have to think about anticoagulation, then you would prefer a tissue valve. Non-compliant, remember children, right? They prefer doing a ROS, right? Rather than putting a mechanical valve. So yes, childbearing age, female patients is one. Remember for us, non-compliance with anticoagulation, issue of again, every month sticking them for the INR, child is playing around, bleeding. So in children, we definitely prefer a tissue valve if we can. Now when we say tissue, it could be a uh, ROS procedure, 
it could be that you put a bioprosthesis and say, you know what, when he becomes an adult, then I'll change it and put a metallic valve. But in a child, you really have to think before you put in a mechanical valve. For instance, say you have a two-year-old and you have to do something with his aortic valve. You're going to think a hundred times before you go and put in a St. Jude's valve. You may do it when you have no choice. But if you had a choice, you would either do a ROS or you do a homogram, you would do something else. So I think these are your indications for uh, non-mechanical valves. Pregnancy, women, childbearing age, children, and any patients who are prone to hemorrhage. And as we discussed, right-sided lesions like your tricuspid valve, where degeneration is less, but thrombosis is more. Okay, all clear on this one? Now, just a quick thing on operative mortality. Now, early years when they did these valve replacements, the mortality was around 25%. But uh, current risk is around 2%, 2 to 10%, depending on your center. If you do multiple valve replacements, the risk goes up a bit, 5 to 10%. But in general, there has been improved survival in both stenotic as well as regurgitic valves. Now, what you need to remember is that if you replace it, it's not necessarily that you're curing them because they may have other cardiac lesions, they may get prosthetic valve-related problems. So survival is not always great even after metallic, metallic valve replacement. And this, I think you all know that in a stenotic lesion, when you change the valve, the ventricular function recovers right away, whereas if it's a regurgitant lesion, you don't get that kind of incremental improvement in ventricular function. Okay. Now, let me ask you, and this is just something you should know, uh, why do you get gradients across your prosthetic valve and you put it, you know, when you do an echo uh, on your stain jute valve, you always get some little gradient. Why is that? And what is a normal gradient up to what? What would you consider a normal gradient? What would be an abnormal gradient? Okay, so it's altered geometry. It's inherently stenotic, so to some extent it depends, yes, on the size you put in. See, and if you think about it, right, let us say my aortic annulus is 20 millimeters, and that's what I need. When you're putting in the valve, right, a part of my annulus is now taken by that whole freak. So my actual size of the orifice is much less. Also, so that in my dose, your actual valve area is less than what it would be when you were a normal otherwise patient without a valve in there. Now, the second thing that happens is endothelialization. You get your body tissue comes in and endothelializes there. And therefore, all of these valves will have some kind of a gradient. So, this is just, you know, rough gradient, star adverse 6 to 20, because remember we said it's high profile and it, uh, it's, it's much high profile than the rest. Tilting this 5 to 15 millimeters, St. Jude's, what do we say? It has the best profile, right? It's got the best hemodynamics. So its gradients are very low, less than 5 mm. And your postian bioprocessors, it depends uh, on, it depends on that, that scent that you use, it depends on your valve size. They don't have as great hemodynamics as your St. Jude's. Really, your best hemodynamics are with a pie set, next with tilting, next, next with star Edwards and post all your bioprosthetics. Okay, now how do you follow them up? They require regular follow-up at least every year. They need endocarditis prophylaxis. If they've had rheumatic heart disease, they need rheumatic prophylaxis. And you're going to listen to them, listen for their kick, look on x-ray or fluoro and check their echo. Right, all clear on this. Now, what is the INR that you want? What is your goal? When you give anticoagulation in these valves, what INR do you want in an AVR? What INR do you want in an MVR? What do you want in a bioprosthetic valve? So mitral valve 2.5 to 3.5, aortic valve, what do you want? Aortic 2 to 3, AVR 2 to 3, mitral 2.5 to 3. AVR 1.5 to 2.5, okay? Adjusted valve, yes, if you did put a high, because it's very strong, 
If you put a bioprosthetic band, you only need for the first three months. So, okay, so everybody agrees then that the INR will be lower in an AVR compared to an MVR. Now, why is that? Why are you okay with a aortic band having an INR of 2 to 3, but mitral band you want 2.5 to 3.5? Why is that? Why is that different? That is right, but why is that different? Depends on flow, yes, because in an in all, why? Not, this is not because of the gradient so much, but in, when you, what is happening in aortic valve? LV is contracting, pushing blood at high pressure and high speed across the aortic valve. So your chance of clot is much less. In fact, a lot of people argue that maybe you can just keep them on aspirin. But they have found when they just put them on aspirin in the aortic position, there was a higher incidence of thrombosis. So if you go here, and this will be, the first column on your left is your AHA and your APC guideline. The next one is according to the American College of Chest Physicians. So in all of them, if you look, let us go, let's say, stick to the AHA guideline, because so that's easier for all of us. Aortic is 2 to 3, and mitral is 2.5 to 3.5. And that's just because with the aortic, you've got a higher pressure and higher flow coming out. Whereas mitral on the LA side, right, your flow and pressure coming across as that is much less and so there is more thrombogenic. Now moving to a bioprosthetic band, typically you give it for three months some kind of anticoagulation and in three months generally there should be endothelialization that happens and after that as for the AHA guidelines you need to be on aspirin uh, and uh, the bioprosthetic band are not so thrombogenic, right? That's the biggest advantage. So when you, what is the difference between bioprosthetic valve and prosthetic valve? That the bioprosthetic valve is not so thrombogenic, and therefore, just after the first three months. And the reason, in fact, we've argued about this: why do you need anticoagulation in three months? Is because there's a lot of suture, suturing that has happened to put that valve in place, so you can get clot around there. After three months, all the endothelialization has happened. Aspirin is enough, 80 to 100 milligrams per day, uh, and that's all you need for the bioprosthetic band. Now, in the uh, uh, some uh, some people argue that after six months you don't need aspirin, but I think it's quite clear by the AHA ACC guideline that you just continue aspirin so that you don't get microthrombi and so on, or even on the bioprosthetic band. Now, if the patient is an atrial fibrillation, right? Then what happens? And as you can see here, it doesn't really change your anticoagulation. You're still going to keep them. An INR of 2 to 3 and mitral R 2.5 to 3.5 is a very good anticoagulation to prevent any clotting on that band. Okay, all clear on this? I think, uh, you know, um, I think I should end with this.